Thank you. You may be seated. Calling civil case 092292, Christian Perry et al. versus Arnold Schwarzenegger et al. Appearances, counsel. Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson, Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. David Boies of Boies, Schiller, and Flexner on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Theodore J. Boutrous, Jr., Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher also for the plaintiffs. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Christopher Dusso of Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher also for the plaintiffs. <coughs> Good morning, Your Honor. Amir Tehrani from Gibson, Dunn & Crutcher, also for the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Jeremy Goldman from Boy Schiller & Flexner on behalf of the plaintiffs. Good morning, Your Honor. Therese Stewart on behalf of the City and County of San Francisco. Good morning, Your Honor. City Attorney Dennis Herr on behalf of the City and County of San Francisco. Morning. Any other appearances on the plaintiff's side? All right. Mr. Cooper. Morning, Mr. Chief Judge. Charles Cooper with Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Morning. <clears throat> Morning, Your Honor. David Thompson of Cooper and Kirk for the defendant intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Howard Nielsen with Cooper and Kirk also for the defendant intervenors. Morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Nicole Moss for Defendant Intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. Peter Patterson, also for the Defendant Intervenors. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honor. Brian Rahm with the ADF for the Defendant Intervenors. Good morning, Your Honor. James Campbell of the Alliance Defense Fund on behalf of the Defendant Intervenors. Well, we have some other defendants. <laughs> Good morning, Your Honor. Claude Colm, Deputy County Counsel for Defendant Alameda County Clerk Recorder. Good morning. <clears throat> Good morning, Mr. Chief Judge. Manuel Martinez, also for County Clerk Recorder, Mr. Patrick O'Connell. Good morning, Your Honor. Michelle Nod on behalf of Attorney General Brown. Good morning. Good morning, Your Honor. Manuel Medeiros, also on behalf of Attorney General Brown. Good morning, Your Honor. Andrew Stroud, Minnemeyer, Glassman, and Stroud, on behalf of Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger, Mark B. Horton, and Lynette Scott, defendants. Thank you. Good morning. Any other appearances? Well, this is an impressive array of legal talent. <laughs> All this legal talent that seems to be focused on one person at the moment. Um, welcome back. I'm delighted to have you back. Obviously, the hiatus that we've had, the period of time from the presentation of the evidence to the present, is not anything that I would have wished or uh, hoped for. I was hoping that we could uh, get this case in before present. But it may be appropriate that the case is coming to closing argument now. June is, after all, the month for weddings. <laughs> so you have received the schedule, and we've allotted the day for your presentations. And I would simply propose that we get right to business. Mr. Olson, are you leading off for the plaintiffs? All right, that's fine. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honor. With the court's permission today during closings, Mr. Olson will be playing some of the video clips from the trial proceedings. We propose, if this works for the court, that at the end of the day we would offer the transcript pages for the record uh, whenever it's convenient for the court rather than doing it during the closings, and then, then we'll have that for the record. That would seem to make sense, uh, does it not, Mr. Cooper? Sorry, Your Honor, I'm not sure I followed the, the proposal to, to do. Maybe you can clarify. I can clarify. We will be playing video clips from the trial proceedings during the closing arguments. At the end of the day or whenever it is convenient for the court, we would 
offer into the record the transcript pages of the clips that we have played in court marked as exhibits for the record. I understand, and I see no objection to that, Your Honor. That'll be fine. Thank you. Well, any other housekeeping? Good. Mr. Olson. <clears throat> Thank you, Your Honor. Theodore B. Olson, on behalf of the plaintiffs, may it please the court. We conclude this trial, Your Honor, where we began. This case is about marriage and equality. The fundamental constitutional right to marry has been taken away from the plaintiffs and tens of thousands of similarly situated Californians. Their state has rewritten its constitution in order to place them into a special, disfavored category where their most intimate personal relationships are not valid, not recognized, and second rate. Their state has stigmatized them as unworthy of marriage, different, and less respected. Because marriage is at the heart and soul of this case, I want immediately to turn to the subject of marriage and what we have learned during this trial about what it means to be able to marry and then to have the right extinguished. I will focus on marriage from four perspectives, as seen by the proponents of Proposition 8, the Supreme Court of the United States, the plaintiffs, and the experts who came forward to share their knowledge and experience on the subject of marriage and those subjects during this trial. First, the proponents. In the words of their lead counsel, the central and defining purpose of the institution of marriage, what it has always been, is to promote procreation and to channel narrowly procreative act sexual activity between men and women into stable, enduring unions. He went on to say the core need that marriage aims to meet is the child's need to be emotionally, morally, practically, and legally affiliated with the woman and man whose sexual union brought the child into the world. It is quite clear from these statements and other statements made by the proponents during the trial, Your Honor, that the proponents of marriage and the proponents of, I mean, the proponents of Proposition 8 see marriage as an institution of, by, and for the state and to promote procreation and the raising of children by their biological parents, an institution to promote the state's interest. And proponents' counsel added in response to your question, Your Honor, that racial restrictions were never a definitional feature of the institution of marriage. At times during the trial, the proponents predicted grave consequences if same-sex marriage were to be legalized in California. For example, you asked, how does permitting same-sex couples to marry in any way diminish the procreative aspect or function of marriage or denigrate the institution of marriage for heterosexuals? Lead counsel responded, your honor, because it will change the institution. If the institution is deinstitutionalizing, he said, Mr. Blankenhorn will testify that will likely lead to very real social harms such as lower marriage rates and high rates of divorce and non-marital cohabitation with more children raised outside the marriage and separated from at least one of their parents. It is revealing, it seems to me, that the deinstitutionalization me message is quite different from the thrust of the prop proponents' Yes on Eight election campaign. That, in the words they put into the hands of all California voters, focused heavily on protect our children from somehow learning that gay marriage is okay. Protect our children from learning that gay marriage is okay. Those are the words that the proponents put in the ballot, in the voter information guide that was given to every voter. That was not a very subtle theme that there is something wrong, sinister, or unusual about gays, that gays in their relationship are not okay and decidedly not suitable for children, 
but that children might think it was okay if they learned about gays getting married like normal people. For obvious reasons, the gays are not okay message was largely abandoned during the trial in favor of the procreation and deinstitutionalization themes. And after promising proof that people might stop marrying and cease procreating if Proposition 8 were overturned, the proponents switched course from that pl platform as well and affirmatively argued that they actually had no idea and certainly no evidence that any of their prognostications would come to pass if Proposition 8 were to be enacted. Their counsel asserted in his words, the reality is that you will hear nothing but predictions in this trial about what the long-term effects of adopting same-sex marriage will be on the institution of marriage. It is not possible, he said, to render reliable and certain judgments on these things. But it is the plaintiffs, after all, who bear the burden of proof, do they not, Mr. Olson? Yes, and I want to juxtapose the burden of proof with respect to, yes, we have a burden of proof up to a certain point, depending upon the standard of review. But I thought it was very important to juxtapose. And that standard of review being a rational basis? No, we believe, we believe, as we uh, articulated during the course of the trial and memorandum that we submitted just yesterday, that strict scrutiny is required here because this is a discrimination, the taking away of a fundamental right as articulated by the Supreme Court. It's a putting the plaintiffs and others like them in a suspect classification based upon sex and sexual orientation. That, those two things under the Equal Protection Clause and due process clauses justify strict scrutiny. Now, but are you focusing on the facts pertaining to the California initiative or facts pertinent generally and throughout the country with respect to marriage? Both of those. And when I was, what I was going to do, if, with, your, with your Honor's indulgence, is juxtapose what the plaintiffs have said their position is about what marriage is all about and what Proposition 8 would do with these other four perspectives, the Supreme Court, the plaintiffs themselves, and the expert witnesses. But I wanted to complete that one point that the proponents have shifted from protect our children to procreation and deinstitutionalization. Does that make any difference? It, I, I think it does make a difference because I think it suggests the, the vacuum that exists in connection with the attempt by the proponents to provide a basis for what Californians did in November when it passed Proposition 8. Proponents well, counsel, excuse me. No, the um, Supreme Court's decision in the um, Cloverleaf, the Minnesota versus Cloverleaf case, and what the Supreme Court told us there, that was an equal protection case, of course, is that any debatable proposition will support the enactment. And while one challenging on equal protection grounds can certainly introduce evidence that the classification is irrational, if there is any debatable proposition in support of the classification, it passes muster. Well, it has to be a debatable proposition, not that there is debate about a proposition. Yeah. Ah, well now, what's that difference? Well, the difference is that, the, as, as, the, as the Supreme Court said in the Romer case, there has to be a rational objective that the government is seeking to sustain and that the measure itself will advance that rational proposition. Now, the Supreme Court looks at this issue in various different ways, depending upon whether we're talking about strict scrutiny or intermediate scrutiny, as it did in the VMI case, in the gender discrimination context or in the rational basis case. But what the Supreme Court did say in the city of Cleveland case, uh, Cleburne case, that mere negative attitudes, fear, or unsubstantiated factors or assertions won't be sufficiently cognizable, and that's in a rational basis case involving retarded persons and housing. And the proponents' counsel said, it came down to this, same-sex marriage is simply too novel an experiment to allow for any firm conclusions about its long-term effect on societal interests. They just 
don't know. That is the essence of the case as it comes to the end of the trial and to the closing arguments. They just don't know whether same-sex marriage will harm the institution of heterosexual marriage. And I submit that the overwhelming evidence in this case proves that we do know. And the fact is that allowing persons to marry someone of the same sex will not in the slightest deter heterosexuals from marrying, from staying married, or from having babies. In fact, the evidence was from the experts that eliminating invidious restrictions on marriage strengthens the institution of marriage for both heterosexual and homosexual persons and their children. In the face of all of this evidence going in one direction, proponents' argument of last resort that the absence of evidence or logic as a justification uh, is a justification of their various positions. But it's nothing but a fig leaf for the fact that after a three-week trial and an opportunity to present any expert witness they wished, the very best case that the proponents could measure, arrange for us or put forth for you is to argue that Proposition 8 is constitutional because California voters don't know whether allowing gays and lesbians to marry would discourage heterosexuals from procreative marriage, procreative conduct. Well, that is what the proponents say about marriage and the threat to their concept of the institution of marriage from allowing marriage by persons of the same sex. Well, they have identified a difference between opposite sex and same sex couples in that opposite sex couples can procreate without the intervention of some third party. That is a difference. And why is that difference not one that the legislature, or in this case the voters, could rationally take into account in setting the marriage laws in the state of California? As I said, they have to identify something that ties in with the subject matter of the legislation or constitutional provision that they're advancing. Yes, heterosexual people are able independently to procreate. Uh, homosexual people may have that same capacity, but in their relationships, that is not something that occurs. But we're talking about, because of that, taking array, away a right of an intimate relationship that the Supreme Court has called the right of privacy, the right of liberty, and you'd have to explain or make some statement that allowing these other individuals that we represent here today to engage in the institution of marriage will somehow stop that procreation or stop people from getting married or cause them to get divorced. That's one of the positions they took and then they said But doesn't they California don't know. accommodate uh, uh, gays and lesbians by providing domestic partnership rights which are essentially all of the rights associated with marriage? Why isn't that sufficient accommodation? Well, as the experts pointed out, and as the plaintiffs, and I'm going to in a moment or two with your permission, place some excerpts from the testimony of both the plaintiffs and the expert witnesses on that very subject. What marriage means versus something called domestic partnership, which means something completely different. But what I first wanted to do was recite briefly the second perspective on marriage. Now we've heard the proponent's perspective on marriage, and you've alluded to that in your questions to me, I think it's really important to set forth the, the prism through which this case must be viewed by the judiciary, and that is the perspective on marriage, the same subject that we're talking about, by the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, the freedom to marry, the freedom to make the choice to marry, the Supreme Court has said in, I counted 14 cases going back to 1888, 122 years, and these are the words of all of those Supreme Court decisions about what marriage is, and I've set forth this distinction between what the plaintiffs have called it and what the Supreme Court has called it. The Supreme Court has said that marriage is the most important relation in life. Now that's being withheld from the plaintiffs. It is the foundation of society. It is essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness. The right, it's a right of privacy older than the Bill of Rights and older than our political parties. One of the liberties protected by the Due Process Clause, a right of intimacy to the degree of being sacred, 
and a liberty right equally available to a person in a homosexual relationship as to heterosexual persons. That's the Lawrence versus Texas case. Marriage, the Supreme Court has said again and again, is a component of liberty, privacy, association, spirituality, and autonomy. It is a right possessed by persons of different races, by persons in prison, and by individuals who are delinquent and paying child support. It is a right of individuals, not an indulgence dispensed by the state of California to favored, or any state, to favored classes of citizens, which could easily be withdrawn if the state were to change its mind about procreation. In other words, it is a right belonging to Californians, to persons. It is not a right belonging to the state of California. And the right to marry, to choose to marry, has never been conditioned on or tied to procreation. It hardly could be rooted in the state's interest in procreation since the right to marry in Supreme Court cases has been invoked sustaining the right to contraceptives, to divorce, and just a few years ago in that Lawrence case to homosexuals. Well, if the right belongs to Californians individually, why cannot Californians collectively establish the parameters of that right? Well, they can unless, if they, if they, un, if the, unless they're taking away a fundamental right to marry under the Constitution um, um, uh, um, as, with a compelling governmental interest and a proposition would this, case, no. would this case be different if the California Supreme Court in the marriage cases had invalidated the 18,000 or so marriages that were performed from, uh, I believe it was June or May 2008 until November? Yes. yes would, would this be. case be different? It would be different. It in would what be way? less worse. In what way? It's, it's, it's worse in this way. Right now, California has a... 18,000 same-sex marriages, if we can call it that for a moment, heterosexual persons who can marry the person in their choice. If they are a child molester, if they are a wife beater, if they are in prison for 15 murders, they can marry the person of their choice if they're heterosexual. Individuals such as the plaintiffs in this case and those who are similarly situated may not marry the person of their choice. We have a three strikes law in California. You can go to prison for life. But if you're homosexual, you can't get married. There's that category, that people that can get married, the people that can't get married. There's 18,000 people that were married during that period that you described and who are legally married. But if they get divorced or if they're widowed, they can't remarry. And they can't even remarry the same person in the case of a divorce because the Constitution wouldn't recognize well, it. But wouldn't the, wouldn't the marriage regime in California be more rational if, in fact, the California Supreme Court had invalidated those 18,000 marriages? It would be less irrational. That's, we're, I'm not, I don't think it would be rational at all because the distinction that's being made, and by the way, there's a fourth category, people that got married in other states when during a certain period of time or after a certain date, um, and who come to California, now they're living in California in a same-sex relationship and their marriage is recognized. So there's four different categories. If you reduced it to three, yes, it would be less capricious and less arbitrary, but it wouldn't make it constitutional. And I why not? It would not make it constitutional because there is not a compelling governmental interest to put the plaintiffs in a, uh, in a class like this and take away what the Supreme Court has called a fundamental right, a right of liberty, privacy, association, intimacy, and autonomy. You're taking away, the state is, that fundamental right. And even if we did, and, and, and if it was a intermediate scrutiny, you can't rely in the, the VMI case, for example, United States versus Virginia, the Supreme Court said you can't make this up after the fact. One of the Post hoc rationalizations won't work. One of the reasons why I explained to you the shift in position is to show you that the rationalizations that were being offered at the end of the trial were different than the motives that were in the ballot proposition and the advertising. These have become post hoc rationalizations because the proponents don't want to come in here and say, we passed, or the people passed Proposition 8 because they don't, they think gays 
are unusual. They don't want our children to know about them. That sounds awful lot like animus. So the rationalization now is procreation and something called the deinstitutionalization of marriage, whatever in the world that is. I think it's really important, given what the Supreme Court has said about marriage and what the proponents said about marriage, to hear what the plaintiffs have said about marriage and what it means to them in their own words. They have said that Marriage means, and this means not a domestic partnership, this means marriage, the institu social institution of marriage that is so valuable that the Supreme Court says it's the most important relation in life. This, the plaintiffs have said that marriage means to them freedom, pride, these are their words, dignity, belonging, respect, equality, permanence, acceptance, security, honor, dedication, and a public commitment to the world, one of the plaintiffs said, it's the most important decision you make as an adult. Who could disagree with that? I, I would like, with your Honor's permission, now to play a couple of excerpts from the testimony by the four plaintiffs, starting with plaintiffs Katami and Zerillo explaining why they want to marry, because they can say it better than I can. This is, first of all, Plaintiff Katami, followed by Plaintiff Zerillo. Oh, and we, I guess we have to. What do we have to do? Okay. Thank you. Why did you want to get married? There are many reasons. Um, I think. The primary reason for me is because I found someone that I love and that I know I can de dedicate the rest of my life to. Um, and when you find someone who is not only your best friend but your best advocate and supporter in life, um, it's a natural next step for me to want to be married to that person. Now today, you're in a committed relationship uh, with another gay man, correct? Uh, tell me a little bit about that man. The love of my life. I love him probably more than I love myself. I would do anything for him. I would put his needs ahead of my own. I would be with him in sickness and in health richer for poor or death or part, just like Bows. I would, I would do anything for him, and I want nothing more than to marry him. Now, uh, plaintiff Kristen Perry. If the courts of the United States were ultimately decided that you and other same persons seeking to marry someone of the same sex could indeed, did indeed have the constitutional right to get married. Do you think that that would have an effect on other acts of discrimination against you? I believe for me personally as a lesbian that if I had grown up in a world where the most important decision I was going to make as an adult was treated the same way as everybody else's decision, that I would not have been treated the way I was growing up or as an adult. There's something so humiliating about everybody knowing that you want to make that decision and you don't get to. That, you know, it's hard to face the people at work and the, and the people even here right now, and, and it, many of you have this, but I don't, so. I have to still find a way to feel okay and not take every bit of discriminatory behavior toward me too personally because in the end that would only hurt me and my family. So if Prop 8 were undone and kids like me growing up in Bakersfield right now could, could never know what this felt like that I assume that their entire lives would be on a higher arc. They would live with a higher sense of themselves that would improve the quality of their entire life. And plaintiff Sandra Steer. 
Della, tell us what it means to you as a plaintiff in this case, if you were to be successful, how it would change your life? Well, I, I think it would change my life dramatically. Um, the first time somebody said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. I would think, oh, what, that feels good. It feels good and honest and true. Um, I would feel more secure. I would feel more accepted. I'd feel more pride. I'd feel less protective of my kids. I'd feel like, less like I had to protect my kids or worry about them or worry that they feel any shame or um, sense of not belonging. Uh, so I think they're immediate, very real, and very desirable personal gains that I would experience and, of course, close family. Um, but on a different level, you know, as a parent, you're always thinking about that other generation, that next generation, because you're, they're in your house. <laughs> so you're constantly thinking about the world that you're, the society you're in. What are you doing for them? And are we building a good world for them? And I really want that. I want uh, our kids to have a better life than we have right now. When they grow up, I want it to be better for them. And then their kids, I want their lives to be better too. So I really do think about that generation and the possibility of having grandchildren someday and, and having them live in a world where they grow up and whoever they fall in love with, it's okay. Because they can be honored and they can be true to themselves and they can be accepted by society and protected by their government. Um, and that's what I hope can be the outcome of this case in the long run. And as somebody who's from one of those conservative little pockets of the country where there isn't necessarily a lot of difference in the types of people that are there, having those legal protections is everything. It's important for these kids that don't have ready access to all types of people to le at least feel like the option um, to be true to yourself is an option that they can have too. And that's what I hope for. I hope for something for Chris and I, but we're big, strong women. You know, we're, um, we're in a good place in our lives right now. So we would benefit from it greatly, but other people over time I think would benefit it in such a more profound, life-changing way. We had the time, Your Honor. I could not present a more compelling closing argument than simply replaying the testimony in its entirety of the four plaintiffs and Helen Zia. They have described from their hearts what marriage means to them, what it does to them, and says about them to be denied that right. If we did nothing else in this trial, that would be enough. And the two plaintiffs, Perry and Steer, are in a domestic partnership relationship you'll recall during the trial. It isn't the same thing. But we have so much more. There were eight experts, persons who have studied and written about American history, marriage, psychology, sociology, economics, and political science throughout their entire professional lives. I have the time to discuss just a segment of what they had to say, but their evidence was remarkably powerful persuasive and very consistent. Professor Cott, for example, explained that contrary to proponents' assertion, marriage is not primarily a vehicle by which the state promotes procreation. She's an expert in marriage. She testified that its core social meaning, marriage, is a couple's choice to live with one another, to remain committed to one another, and to form a household based on feelings about one another and their agreement to join in an economic partnership and support one another in terms of the material needs of life. She said it is an aspect of liberty, a basic civil right, the ability to marry is an expression of one's freedom. Those are the same things coming from the expert on marriage that the Supreme Court has been saying for 122 years. And contrary to proponents' assertions, racial restrictions have indeed been a definitional feature of marriage. For example, as we learn from her, slaves were not permitted to marry until the Emancipation Proclamation. And she testified, and I'd like to play that excerpt, if we can do the same mechanical things, 
uh, to have her testify what it meant to the slaves. What happened when slaves were emancipated? When slaves were emancipated, they flocked to get married. And this was not trivial to them by any means. They saw the ability to marry legally to replace the informal unions in which they had formed families and had children, many of them, to replace those informal unions with legal valid marriage in which the states in which they lived would presumably protect their vows to each other. Uh, in fact, one quote that historians have drawn out from the record uh, because many of these ex-slaves were illiterate, of course, but one quotation that is the title of an article a historian wrote is, it was said by an ex-slave who had also been a Union soldier, and he declared, the marriage covenant is the foundation of all our rights, meaning that it was the most everyday exhibit of the fact that, that he was a free person. He could say, I do, to his partner. What a powerful statement that slave made. The marriage covenant is the foundation of all of our rights. It exemplified freedom. He could say, I do, to his partner. Then, Professor Cott explained the meaning and definition of marriage. Now, she is just about the leading expert, certainly the finest expert we could find, to talk about the history of marriage and its definition in American society and American culture and what it means to individuals in this society to be able to be marry, married and to have the choice of the person to whom one would marry. Another video clip. To go back to something you mentioned a moment ago, what do you today, based on the collection of events that make up our history as a nation, view as the key defining characteristics of the institution of marriage in the United States? So mutual consent uh, between partners who freely choose each other and their commitment to establish a continuing stable relationship as the foundation for a household in which they will economically support one another and their dependents and enable themselves to compose a family. Do you believe that uh, a law recognizing and the ability of individuals of the same sex to marry would be consistent and would, would uh, include those characteristics you have just identified as being defining? Yes. Why? It seems to me that couples of the same sex have expressed many of the same motivations as couples of different sex to marry and to establish stable households. And uh, in that regard, uh, especially in an era when um, families um, can have children that are not the result of biological procreation, and so many families do, that it seems to me same-sex couples fulfill the aims of marriage from the point of view of the state. And certainly it's up to any uh, partner, uh, intimate pair to decide whether they wish to be married or not. But uh, it seems to me that by excluding same-sex couples from the ability to marry and engage in this highly valued institution that um, society is actually denying itself another, uh, another resource for stability and social order. So we learned also during the trial that racial restrictions on the right to marry were finally eliminated for good in Loving versus Virginia in 1967 ending laws like Proposition 8, which prohibited certain marriage choices for citizens that had once existed in 41 states. Proposition 8 is very, very much like those restrictions. Dr. Cott explained, because it prevents a complete choice 
as to marriage and designates gays and lesbians as less worthy and entitled to less honor, less status, and fewer benefits. Marriage is special, the experts tell us. Domestic partnerships and civil unions are pale comparisons. As Dr. Cott put it, there is nothing that is like marriage except marriage. And the state's approval lends prestige and acceptance to the institution. As Dr. Peplaw testified, married couples are healthier, live longer, are emotionally more stable, and better off on every measure of health. Domestic partnership is a harmful structural stigma. That's what Dr. Elon Mayer said. Moreover, removing the stigma imposed by Proposition 8 would produce powerful collateral benefits. Here is Dr. Meyer, one of the world's leading experts on stigma and discrimination. Dr. Meyer, do you see a connection between the concealment process and Proposition 8 and its denial of marriage rights? Well, again, to the extent that we see Proposition 8 as part of the stigma, as something that propagates the stigma, uh, it certainly doesn't send a message that it's okay. <laughs> you can be who you want to be. You know, we respect that. We, we welcome you as part of the community. It sends the opposite message in my mind. And therefore, would uh, I would think, um, add to that pressure, to that uh, uh, social environment that that uh, encourages people, some people, to conceal, and and also uh, when when I talk about those effects of Proposition Eight, by the way, they don't only affect gay people; they also send the same message to other people who are not themselves gay. So in that sense, it's it's not just damaging to gay people because they feel bad about their rejection. It also sends a message that it is okay to reject, not only that it's okay, that it is very highly valued by our constitution to reject uh, uh, gay people, to designate them uh, uh, a different class of people in terms of their intimate relationships. I was struck, Your Honor, by that same word appearing again and again, um, that word okay. Um, Sandy Steer just wanted her children to fee feel okay about who they were and who they were living with, their parents. They just wanted to feel okay. It was okay to be gay. But the proponents in their voter information guide that they told every voting citizen that we must protect our children from teaching that gay marriage is okay. And Dr. Meyer testified that the stigma propagated by Proposition 8 is that it's not okay to be gay, that it's abnormal, unusual, certainly not okay, and is a basis for rejection of the individual. The experts testified not only that same-sex marriage would not harm the institution of marriage or diminish heterosexual interest in marriage. They explained as well that the elimination of discriminatory barriers to marriage and harmful stigmas would, as it has in the past, strengthen the institution of marriage and strengthen our country. We are not talking, just talking, about the couples who wish to get married. We are talking about their children. In 2005, there were 37,000 of California's children living in households headed by same-sex same couples. The evidence was uncontradicted during this trial and overwhelming that the lives of these children would be better if they were living in a marital household. Even Mr. Blankenhorn, the proponent's witness, proponent's principal witness, agreed with that proposition. And here we have another excerpt from the testimony, Mr. Blankenhorn. And you believe that permitting gay and lesbian couples to marry would significantly advantage the gays and lesbians themselves and the children that they're raising, correct, sir? 
When you say advantage, do you mean improve the well-being of? Yes. Uh, my answer to your question is that I believe that adopting same-sex marriage would be likely to improve the well-being of gay and lesbian households and their children. That is the plaintiff's principal expert witness, that approving same-sex marriage would be likely to improve the well-being of gay and lesbian households and their children. I was stricken by Dr. Mr. Blankenhorn's testimony about the other societal benefits that would arise from permitting gays and lesbians to marry. Mr. Blankenhorn admitted on the witness stand that same-sex marriage would yield numerous social benefits. I don't have time to do all of this, but I want to play two excerpts. Um, here's one. The seventh positive consequence, which you agreed with, was that gay marriage would be a victory for the worthy ideas of tolerance and inclusion. It would likely decrease the number of those in society who tend to be viewed warily as, quote, other, close quote, and increase the number who are accepted as part of, quote, us, close quote. In that respect, gay marriage would be a victory for and another key expansion of the American idea. Uh, and I have read those correctly, have I not, sir? Yes, sir. He testified that it would decrease the number of those in society who would be viewed warily as other, in other words, not okay, and the elimination of that stigma and that discrimination, according to Mr. Blankenhorn, would be a victory for the American idea. He went on to say something somewhat along the same line, but it's important to recall it. You say, I believe that today the principle of equal human dignity must apply to gay and lesbian persons. Do you see that? Yes, sir. And the I there is you, correct? That's correct. And you say, in that sentence, in that sense, insofar as we are a nation founded on this principle, we would be more, emphasize more, American on the day we permitted same-sex marriage than we were on the day before. And you wrote those book, those words, did you not, sir? I wrote, the, wrote those words. And you believed them then, correct? That's correct. And you believe them now, correct? That's correct. So the plaintiff's, I mean the proponent's principal witness believes that gay and lesbian individuals would be better off, their children would be better off, we would be closer to the American ideal or the American idea and applying, he said, the principle of equal human dignity upon which this country was founded. We will be more American the day we permit same-sex marriages. That is the proponent's principal witness. And that, Your Honor, is the four perspectives that we saw in this case about marriage. On the one hand, we have the proponent's argument that it's all about procreation and institutionalizing, deinstitutionalizing marriage, but was not supported by credible evidence. I couldn't find any. That's the one hand. On the other stands the combined weight of 14 Supreme Court opinions about marriage and the liberty and privacy of marriage, the testimony of the plaintiffs about their life and how they're affected by Proposition 8, and the combined expertise of the leading experts in the world, as far as we were able to find. It is no contest. So, Your Honor, it's important to emphasize the plaintiffs have no interest in changing marriage or deinstitutionalizing marriage. They desire to marry because they cherish the institution. They merely wish for themselves the status that the state of California accords to their neighbors, to their friends, their coworkers, and their relatives. The plaintiffs are in the same position as Mildred Jeter and Richard Loving, who in 1967 had no interest in diluting 
the institution of marriage. They only wanted to marry the person they loved, the person of their choice, who happened to be a person of a different race. That's all the plaintiffs desire, the right to marry the person they love, the person of their choice, who happens to be of the same sex. Mr. Olson, at the beginning of the case, Mr. Cooper said, Judge, this case involves legislative facts. We've just heard much of the testimony. Would you agree with that characterization? I felt at the beginning, Your Honor, and we made this point at the motion for a preliminary injunction, that Proposition 8, on its face, distinguishes, discriminates against a class of individuals. It does the same thing, and I was going to mention this in a moment, and I probably will emphasize it in a moment, is does the same thing that the Romer decision, by taking away a class of rights from an individual, a group of individuals, a classification of individuals to take away their rights based upon their sexual orientation. It's exactly what this case does, Proposition 8 does. And harking back to Lawrence versus Texas, the Supreme Court of the United States said that the conduct which characterizes sexual orientation in this case is a protected constitutional right. So Proposition 8 takes away the fundamental right to marry from a class of persons based upon their practice of something that's been decided to be a fundamental constitutional right of liberty, privacy, association. And I believe then... Is there a yes or no in all of yes. that? Yes. <laughs> well, yes and no, if I may have that. <laughs> yes, I believe this case could be decided on whatever Mr. Cooper means by legislative facts, but facts that are apparent from the proposition itself, from what we know and don't need a trial to prove, that these people are being selected out on the basis of their sexual orientation. And what the Supreme Court says, has said consistently again and again about the fundamental rights involved here. I think you could have made that decision. You decided that we should have a trial to examine the facts. Marriage, um, the classification of individuals, what marriage means, what it's like to be taken away, what is the effect of discrimination, what is the history of discrimination. And I now think that that was an exceedingly wise decision because whatever you decide, we now have not just the Supreme Court decisions and not just what we know about discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, but now we have heard what it really matters like in real life. It really, we know what it's like from the experts, and we've had the opportunity to explore these things. This has been a great education. I think not just to the people in this room, but the people who read this record. Well, and I might add, this is the kind of record that was created as an antecedent to the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education. It's the kind of record that was created in the VMI case and other cases of discrimination. And so the legislative facts, what I really don't, honest to heavens, know exactly what legislative facts are, or I wouldn't try to distinguish them, but the facts that we do know as a result of the Constitution, what we know about people, what we know the classification, those support a finding that this is unconstitutional. Well, I assume that the term legislative facts refers to facts that it is appropriate for the judiciary to decide or not to decide. And that is the distinction which uh, Mr. Cooper is attempting to draw. So when is it appropriate for the judiciary to weigh in on legal and constitutional questions that may touch on sensitive social issues. What are the criteria that a court should look at in deciding whether or not it should render a decision that a certain right or lack of right uh, implicates constitutional considerations? What a, when does it become ripe for the court to weigh in on these issues? Well, 
I think that it undoubtedly depends upon what the state is trying to do, how that state's action is going to affect citizens, and if we turn to the 14th Amendment, not just citizens, but persons. And I think the cases are going to be different depending upon those things and certain other related facts. But if I read the cases going back to 1888 on the due process part of the marriage right, and if I read the cases going back to the Yip Wo decision in 1886 where the Supreme Court struck down the right of a Chinese person in this city to operate a laundry, I look back at those decisions and I think what the court is doing is making an appropriate judgment as to whether or not it needs more information about what has happened, what the state is trying to accomplish, whether its objective is being served in a narrow basis so that it's not over-inclusive or under-inclusive. Um, those kind of facts that we learned during the course of this trial, I think aid the decision that you're being expected to make and will aid the record that that decision will have before it, with it, when it's reviewed in the Court of Appeals and will aid in the understanding by the American people what the rights are that we're talking about. I think it's, at the end of the day, as I said, I thought we didn't need the trial, but at the end of the day, I think it's an enormously enriching and important undertaking. Well, now, the Supreme Court in the Baker versus Nelson case decided that the issue which we are confronted with here was not ripe for the Supreme Court to weigh in on. That was 1972. What's happened in the 38 years well, since 1972? Well, a, a great deal has happened. Among the, among the things that have happened is the Romer case. Among the things that have happened is the Lawrence versus Texas case. You know what those cases involve. Uh, another, a lot of other things have happened. Changes in the ballot propositions. California has adopted something completely different than the state, I guess, was Minnesota or Michigan involved in, in that case. So there are a lot of factual situations that are different. This case is very different. Uh, and by the way, the Supreme Court rejected the opportunity to take a miscegenation case. Now, I think it was Dr. Cott testified this, I think it was 1955, and then they took the case, the Loving case in 1967. The same issue was before the court, I think also in the Zablocki case, where there was a summary of affirmance of an earlier case. It might have been, I think, I take that back, it was Turner versus Safley, the case involving a fundamental right to marriage for prisoners, Turner versus Safley. The Supreme Court, at, in that- What year was that? Pardon? What year was that? Um, well, one of your colleagues will get that. Yeah, part. I have that um, very close by, but I will, I will mention it in, in any a moment. Event. In at any, any event, at, at any rate, I thought that was interesting. We talked about it somewhat at the, um, it was 1987, uh, but it talked about the fact that the, the court was urged not to take, said the court had already decided that case because it was an earlier summary affirmance in that case. And the court went on to take the case. It pointed out that that Mandel case that's cited at, uh, with respect to summary affirmance cases, the facts were different, the time was different, a lot of things that happened since then, and the, court, the, courts, the lower courts and the Supreme Court were not bound by that prior summary affirmance. But we have learned so much in the years since that case or that summary affirmance but, the, but we've also learned a lot from the Supreme Court. Remember the Supreme Court in Lawrence versus Texas reversed Bowers versus Hardwick, which was only 20 years earlier. That's a big difference. And what the Supreme Court, the, the opinion for the Supreme Court in Lawrence versus Texas quotes and makes a part of its holding Justice Stevens's dissent in Bowers versus Hardwick. There couldn't be a more complete shift in point of view in that period of time. But apparently a change of point of view by Justice O'Connor. It was, well, no, Lawrence versus Texas was a six to three decision. She wrote a concurring opinion on, on equal protection grounds, but the majority right. opinion signed by five, Justice Kennedy and, and four other justices um, decided that case on the basis of due process. And the Romer case, 
which involved sexual orientation in Colorado not very many years ago, um, the late 90s, I think, um, decided to reject a class discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. Those Supreme Court decisions inform our decision. How important in that case was the fact that the initiative measure in Romer took away from the voters of the municipalities of Colorado the opportunity to pass uh, anti-discrimination ordinances as opposed to simply a blanket uh, prohibition against the enactment of those initiatives in the first place. Well, the court said it was significant that there was a taking away of rights. I don't know what I would have decided if that had been the blanket prohibition of the granting of those rights. We have had cases like Romer, though, going back to Reitman versus Mulkey in 1964, where the citizens of Colorado decided to rewrite its constitution, California, to rewrite its constitution it was Proposition 14. And it, housing, uh, fair housing. That was the fair housing issue. And the, and the voters of California said, we're going to amend our constitution and we're going to uh, repeal all the fair housing statutes and affirmatively give a right to any citizen to sell his or her house to whoever they wanted, irrespective of race. That went to the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, we can discern, speaking of legislative facts, we can discern that the motives involved in that were taking away rights of individuals that existed in that case on the basis of race. Then comes the Romer decision. There's an intervening case involving busing from the state of uh, Washington that goes to the Supreme Court where the voters again did something to their constitution to change issues with respect to civil rights. Similarity here is that in Romer, individuals were protected by state laws from discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. In California, individuals lost the right to marry on the basis of sexual orientation. And the Supreme Court said, you've taken away the rights of these individuals for redress. The only way they can seek redress is to go to their fellow citizens and amend the Colorado Constitution. And the plaintiffs here, the only thing they can do to restore their rights is go to the citizens and seek to amend the Constitution. So in each case, rights have been taken away because of sexual orientation, and the barrier is placed in the Constitution. Let's see if I can get an answer this time. Would this case be different if California had never permitted same-sex marriage? It would be different, but we would still be unconstitutional because it is a stronger case because there are four categories of citizens. It's a stronger case because the California Supreme Court said in the California Constitution there is a right of an individual to marry someone of the same sex and the citizens of California. So the facts here are stronger simply because there was a period of time, albeit six months, in which the state of California permitted same-sex marriage. I, I, I submit that that is correct, Your Honor, and the political scientists that were here talked about the initiative referendum process by which minority rights are particularly vulnerable because they don't have any room to negotiate. Their, their rights are being put up for kind of a, what kind of a constitutional system is it that because of a California Supreme Court decision which had a shelf life of six months, that that creates a greater entitlement than if that right had never existed in the first place. Well, it, California Supreme Court, I think, would say that we didn't invent that right. We determined when it was brought before us that the California Constitution, which we are not changing, we are interpreting, contains that right. Now, that has happened again and again where courts recognize the dis discrimination that it's imposing upon citizens. We could say the same about the separate school in Texas, the law school, Sweat versus Texas, uh, Sweat versus, Painter versus Sweat, can't remember exactly the name of the case, where Texas set up a separate school system, uh, a separate law school for African Americans. We could say the same thing about Virginia and setting up a um, uh, male-only 
Virginia Military Institute. Uh, we could say the same thing about Plessy versus Ferguson. Where, didn't, where in the world in 1954 did the Supreme Court come up with this right that didn't exist right before then? So I think that it is, it, that it is a more forceful fact because of the Romer case and the, because of the taking away of the rights. But I, has, I hasten to say that if this was, this, we were writing on a, a clean slate, which we might be if we're litigating the same issue in the next door state, I would be making the same arguments. You are, you, the citizens of XYZ state, are selecting out people on the basis of sexual orientation, a practice which the Supreme Court says is a constitutionally protected right, and you're putting them in a separate category with respect to another fundamental right, the right to marry. The, the statute in Lawrence, of course, was a criminal statute. Yes. Um, the denial of the right to marriage to same-sex couples is not, doesn't have any criminal sanction. There isn't any uh, sanction that attaches to it. It's simply a denial of access to the estate of marriage. That's not a criminal penalty. So I, I, I how, submit how it doesn't make any difference. If we're talking about, if, in, if once this Lawrence versus Texas recognized the constitutional right to in, the, what the court repeatedly talked about in Lawrence versus Texas is the right of individuals, the constitutional right of individuals, this is on page 574 of the Lawrence opinion, uh, law, our laws and our tradition afford constitutional protection to personal decisions relating to marriage, procreation, contraception, family relationship, child rearing, and education. That's not a complete list. And then the court goes on to say, persons in a homosexual relationship may seek autonomy for these purposes just as heterosexual persons do. The court was talking about the private, intimate behavior. If the court had said, instead you can go to jail for five days because we caught you doing those things, we will take away your right to drive on the highways. We will take away your right to marry because you do those things or you engage in that conduct. It seems to me that that is just as unconstitutional, especially if the thing which is taken away is also a fundamental constitutional right. In other words, because you engage in something that's protected by our Constitution, we're going to take away, some, because we don't like it, we're going to take away a right to do another thing that's protected by our Constitution. That can't be constitutional. And so I don't think that there's any distinction. I, don't, I, I submit that there can't be any distinction. And the language of the decision talks about the individual right to engage in that activity that can't be a precondition for engaging in the right to marry. Should, should the review here be different with respect to your due process claim and your equal protection claim? No, we submit that strict scrutiny is required in either case for different reasons. Due process, as I've explained, and the Supreme Court over and over again has affirmed, provides a fundamental constitutional right rooted in privacy, liberty, association, and so forth to engage in the institution of marriage, not a false institution of marriage, not a something that is not citizenship, but it's called something else. It's called something else. It is the fundamental right of marriage, which has all of the significance we learned. You're taking that away. That requires strict scrutiny because our fundamental rights can't be taken away unless the state has a very, very fundamental, strong, compelling reason to do so, and it acts with surgical precision so that it takes no more than the compelling reason justifies. In the equal protection context, we are talking about a group of individuals who meet every one of the standards for a, a, um, suspect classification. Um, they, they are a minority. They've been discriminated. There wasn't any dispute about that. It's an immutable characteristic. The witnesses said that. The plaintiffs said that. The expert witnesses said that. The Ninth Circuit has said that in the Hernandez case. Um, the, the, they have been victims of discrimination. They're classified according to that basis. They, there's been an issue there. How I can see that there has been some argument about whether or not they have sufficient, they have political power. But there has been a change, of course, because 
And uh, the, um, I will mention a Frontiero case, which is a sex discrimination case, where there have been improvements. The legislature had enacted pieces of legislation protecting women from sexual discrimination. And the Supreme Court said that sort of proves what we're saying, that these, these individuals, because of their sex, have been discriminated against, and the legislature has recognized that by having to pass these laws to protect them from bad treatment, from harassment, or whatever. What I'm, what, th there has been an in in increase in sensitivity in this state and other places. But Professor Segura from Stanford specifically said, I weigh all of these things. And by the way, that the political power issue is not a fundamental predicate for suspect classification anyway. But I'm saying that he testified that indeed these individuals are lacking in political power to get their positions advanced and accepted by the population. And if we had to go no further than the Romer case, the Romer case starts with the language we do not make in this country classifications of our, among our citizens. And that is a classification that the Supreme Court dealt with based upon sexual orientation. Um, and that is impermissible. But if you didn't have strict scrutiny, you would have uh, discrimination on the basis of sex and sexual orientation. The individual that are before you today do not have a choice for the person they wish to marry because the person is the wrong sex. They can choose anybody that they want except the state's decided that it has to be a person of a certain sex. So their choice is foreclosed on the basis of sex, the sex of the person they wish to marry and sexual orientation. And the cases support a high level of scrutiny in that case. Your Honor pointed out at the conclusion of the summary judgment hearing this issue is not about same-sex marriage. Just as in 1967, it wasn't about interracial marriage. It was the right in 1967, in the Loving case, the right to marry without limitation based on race. Here, the issue is the right to marry without limitation based upon sex. That's another reason why this requires heightened scrutiny. The, the, Evidence was overwhelming that this is a stigma. It's a government-imposed stigma. It's a, it's a government-imposed stigma placed in the Constitution of the state of California. What could be a stronger signal to other citizens and to other people that they are not okay? These people are not normal. They can Proposition be- Proposition 8 is unconstitutional. Where does that leave the domestic partnership laws? the way they were on the day before uh, Proposition 8 was enacted. Um, if people want to have a business partnership, they can enter into something called a domestic partnership. Maybe lots of people don't want to get married despite everything we've been saying about how wonderful it is. That is a choice. <laughs> that is a choice, the Supreme Court has said, and Dr. Cott specifically said not everybody wants to get married. Um, but it is important, and she said it's we don't even understand it if we can do it. It is the people that don't have the right that understand how harmful it is and how much it hurts. But if you wish to have a, the state of California can have all kinds of relationships between persons. This, as, as you heard on the stand from the plaintiffs um, and the witnesses, the expert witnesses, that's a business deal. No one aspires as a child I think it was Dr. Meyer who said this. No one aspires as a child to grow up and enter into a domestic partnership. But they do aspire as children to grow up and be married. The other witnesses, the witnesses also told us you don't have a celebration when you have a domestic partnership. You do have a celebration when you get married. It means there's so much that was said during the course of the trial about the meaning and significance of marriage. And the Supreme Court in Zablocki said that the right to marry is of fundamental importance to all individuals. Um, it comes down to, just with respect to the due process part, the, the, if, whether you're applying strict scrutiny, which is a very exhaustive examination of the objectives of the state, or heightened scrutiny, which is a very serious examination and to meet the, the needs and the fit 
the, the state's interest versus what it's done to advance those interests, or whether it's called rational basis. On all of those bases, bases the, whatever the objective that the proponents want, wanted to accomplish for the state of California, and we don't know because it keeps changing, it isn't being accomplished. The latest words from the proponents, the, the counsel for the proponents is, we don't know. We don't know whether there's going to be any harm. And I would submit that we've always done it that way, that it's a traditional definition of marriage, which is something that we've always done it that way, is the same, is a corollary to the, because I say so. It's not a reason. You can't have continued discrimination in public schools because you've always done it that way. You can't have continued discrimination between uh, races on the basis of marriage because you've always done it that way. Um, that line of reasoning would have prevented the loving marriage. It would have justified racially segregated schools and maintaining subordinate status for, for married women. Um, we heard a great deal for, about that relationship uh, from Dr. Cott. So, the constitutional right to marry is fundamental. The constitutional right to be able to be in a relationship with a person of the same sex is a fundamental constitutional right. And in a sense, the state of California is burdening both of those, burdening in a very severe way, severe way that hurts individuals and it doesn't do any good to prevent those persons from getting married because the evidence was also overwhelming in this regard. Heterosexual people are not going to stop getting married. They're not going to abandon their marriage. And they're not going to stop having children because their next door neighbor has a marriage that's a person of the same sex. That is not going to happen. The evidence said that wasn't going to happen. Although there was some talk about how the nether it may have happened in the Netherlands, that evidence folded. Um, and disappeared before our eyes when it was cross-examined. Dr. Cott, I think it was Dr. Cott or maybe it was Dr. Peplow, said the four years before in Massachusetts and the four years after the statistics were the same, marriage the same, divorce is the same and that sort of thing. And the statistics from the Netherlands um, didn't establish that proposition either. In fact, um, the evidence was that the so-called deinstitutionalization of marriage has been coming about to the extent there's a weakening of the bonds of marriage in our society because of no-fault divorce and because of one of our witness, um, expert witnesses said from 1970 to 1985, all over the world, marriage rate fell off, divorce rates went up and things like that. Those were heterosexual people. That wasn't because of a same-sex marriage or a threat of a same-sex marriage or the danger of a same-sex marriage or someone being taught about a same-sex marriage. That was a, a false premise. So, with respect to the Equal Protection Clause, I go back to that Yik Wo case where the Supreme Court said the right to the equal protection of the laws is the protection of equal laws. And in that case, this is 1886, because of a Chinese person not being able to run a laundry in this city, the court stated that the very idea that a person would be denied a material right essential to the enjoyment of life, that's marriage, seems to be intolerable in any country where freedom prevails as being the very essence of slavery. Well, we know that taking away the right to marry was indeed the very essence of slavery. Yet that very freedom once denied to slaves and denied to interracial couples throughout this country is now being denied to the plaintiffs, not because they're Chinese in this case, not because of their race, but because of their sexual orientation. How can it be wrong in those areas and right in this area under the Equal Protection Clause? That does not square with any of the language that the Supreme Court has used in deciding equal protection cases. And that has been Use, that same language has been used to strike down classes among citizens. That's the language of Romer. That principle has been extended from race to nationality, to ancestry, to sex, to the legitimacy, to the favoring of the husband in matters of marital property, 
and in 1996 in the Romer case uh, to sexual orientation. So proposition to wrap this up, because um, I want to be sensitive to the time constraints, um, Proposition 8 discriminates on the basis of sex in the same way that the Virginia law struck down in, in loving discriminated on the basis of race. They could marry whoever they want unless that person was the wrong race. The plaintiffs in this state can marry someone, whoever they want, except because of their sex or their sexual orientation. Sexual orientation, as I said, is the same, the sexual orientation discrimination is the same thing here as it was in Colorado. Um, and the, we, we're, the classification, we did it because we don't know. We're, we're, that's the reason. We don't know what's going to be the outcome. We did it because we don't know is the same as saying we don't know why we did it. Well, can't voters, you know, rely on their common everyday experience and the impressions that they have? And as the uh, New York uh, court held, make a decision even if it doesn't withstand scientific scrutiny? Well, it depends upon the decision and it depends upon the scrutiny because every ordinary citizen, of course, has got grave, great responsibility in this country. Um, but as Mr. Blankenhorn said, we'd be closer to the American ideal if we eliminated this kind of discrimination. What is that voter common sense or ordinary citizen? I hate the term ordinary citizen, but because I think that every citizen is special. But yes, citizens can use their common sense. But what was their common sense in this case to take away the right of these individuals to marry. We don't know, I don't think I know, as a result of this case that's gone on for a year and the evidence in this case, I don't believe that it's because state must protect procreation among heterosexual persons or the institution of marriage that much of that procreation takes place in. A lot of it doesn't, but that's not what it is because there is no evidence that one couple or one pair of individuals in this state or in this country will decide I'm not getting married because those people are getting married. There is no evidence of that and there's no evidence that there will be a diminished procreative instinct, God forbid, because people <laughs> are allowed in the privacy of their homes to enter into an intimate relationship because they want a family like someone else. So if you have an analysis of the common sense of people and without, even without all these experts, what were they thinking? I think the clearest evidence of that is protect our children from learning or being taught that gay marriage is okay. And that means that gay people's marriage is not okay and that means gay people are not okay. Now if there is a reason for why Proposition 8 serves a legitimate, that's what it says, the court says we've, we've got to inquire as to what the reason is. We've got to inquire and we've got to inquire whether the enactment advances that reason. So what is the legitimate reason and how does Proposition 8 advance it? I submit that we don't know what that reason is. Whatever that reason is, it can't be a post hoc rationalization. Do I have to find that it is a discriminatory motive? Pardon me? Do I have to find that it is a discriminatory motive on the part of the voters? Well, that yes. This is an effort to I mean, establish is, some private morality through the initiative process? Well, the, the Lawrence case talks about the private morality and that in, in a, as an improper basis. Um, is it discriminatory? We ha it has to be found that it's discriminatory. It, it says Awfully some people... discriminatory. Pardon unlawful, me? Unlawfully discriminatory. Well, some it discrimi is, uh, many is. discriminations are perfectly uh, yes. lawful and perfectly constitutional. That's right. And I'm saying that, and I'm saying that it is irrespective of the motive of a particular person in the voting booth. Nice people voted for Proposition 8 and people that didn't have nice motives voted in, in favor of Proposition 8. We heard all kinds of evidence during the course of the trial of some awful stuff that was being told to people about gay people. 
But I, I submit, and I'm willing to acknowledge that, I mean, there's plenty of good Californians that voted for Proposition 8 because they're uncomfortable with gay people. They're uncomfortable with gay people entering into marriage, and they're uncomfortable with the very idea that gay people are just like us. They didn't hear, and too bad they couldn't have seen, the evidence in this trial of what the psychologist said and the sociologist said um, and the psychiatrist said about this is a characteristic of between individuals that is normal and it's acceptable and it's not someone who is engaged in bad conduct. Now you can have a religious view that this is not acceptable. You can have a religious view. It was true in the Loving case. The argument was made that it's God's will that people not of different races not be married. It's in the briefs. And it was in the testimony in this trial that people honestly felt that it was wrong to mix the races, that it would dilute the value of the race and do all of these terrible things. People honestly felt that way, but they were, they were, they were permitted under the Constitution to think that. But they're not permitted under the Constitution to put that law of that view into the law and to put that view into the constitution of their state to, in order to discriminate against individuals. I think, Your Honor, that this law is discriminatory. The evidence is overwhelming that it imposes great social harm on individuals who are our equals. They are members of our society, they pay their taxes, they want to form a household, they want to raise their children in happiness and in, in the same way that their neighbors do. We are imposing great damage on them by the institution of the state of California saying they are different and they cannot have the happiness, they cannot have the privacy, they cannot have the liberty they cannot have the intimate association in the context of a marriage that the rest of our citizens do. We have demonstrated during this trial that that causes grave and permanent, irreparable, and totally unnecessary harm because we're withholding from them a part of the institution of marriage that we hold. One of the language of one of those Supreme Court decisions is on the point, intimacy to the point of being sacred that right of marriage in the, in, in the context of the intimate relationship, we're withholding that from them, hurting them, and we're doing no good. If we had a reason, a really good reason for inflicting all of that harm, that might be another matter, but there is no reason that I heard. Preserving the institution of marriage, we've improved the institution of marriage when we allowed interracial couples to get married. Well, we've improved the institution of marriage when we allowed women to be equal partners in the marital relationship. We've improved the institution of marriage when we didn't put artificial barriers based upon race. And we will improve the institution of marriage and we will be more American, according to Mr. Blankenhorn, when we eliminate this terrible stigma. There's 14 Supreme Court decisions that talk about the right to marriage. There's the Romer case. That uh, you know what that holds, and the Lawrence versus Texas case, and the testimony of all of these witness, <coughs> expert witnesses, and the testimony of the plaintiffs, that erects an insurmountable barrier to the proponents of this proposition. It will not hurt Californians, it will benefit Californians, but as long as it doesn't hurt Californians to get rid of a harmful stigma in their constitution that's labeling people into classes, then it's unconstitutional. Thank you, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Olson. City and County of San Francisco, uh, Ms. Stewart. Good morning, <clears throat> Your Honor. Morning. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to address the court today, although uh, Mr. Olson, like Mr. Boyes, is a hard act to follow, but uh, I'll give it my best and very brief shot. Um, I want to focus my comments on two questions that the court posed to the plaintiffs about the evidence that we presented that um, state and local governments benefit economically if same-sex couples are permitted to marry or stated otherwise that um, denying same-sex couples the right to marry um, deprives the government of revenue and costs the government money. And question eight asks about the relevance of that uh, uh, data, that, that evidence. 
And I want to just start by acknowledging that the fact that legislation costs the government money is neither necessary nor sufficient to prove a constitutional violation. But here, the evidence of the cost to the government is relevant to whether Proposition 8 is rational or satisfies any other level of scrutiny. Here, the costs to the government are symptomatic of serious harms, many of which uh, my colleague, Mr. Olson, referred to, that Proposition 8 visits on a segment of society, um, and, and the harms that gay men and lesbians suffer as a result of Proposition 8 are also visited on society as a whole, because government and taxpayers, in part, pay for the costs of that discrimination. Now, I want to point to a Supreme Court case in which the court did consider the harms both to individuals and to society that were caused by legislation in evaluating the constitutionality of the law challenged. And that's the case of Plyler versus Doe in which the court struck down a Texas statute that uh, prevented undocumented children from attending public schools. And the court in that case stated, I'm going to quote, in determining the rationality of the statute, we may appropriately take into account its costs to the nation and to the innocent children who are its victims. And the court, in striking the law down in that case, considered the following evidence. It considered, with respect to the children, the stigma of illiteracy that would mark them for the rest of their lives. It considered the toll that the legislation would take on their social, uh, intellectual, economic, and psychological well-being. But it also considered, on the side of society, social science data showing how important the public schools are in inculcating fundamental values that are necessary to maintaining our democratic system. It also considered the fact that education provides basic tools by which individuals can be economically productive in their lives to the benefit of society as a whole. So like, uh, in, as in Plyler, the, the serious harms that Proposition 8 imposes on lesbians and gay men and their children and on government and society at large undercut the contention that Proposition 8 is rational. They also, I think, support the inference that Proposition 8 was born of animus because, as Romer teaches us, laws that can't be understood or explained by any kind of rational uh, thinking um, give rise to an inference that they're based on prejudice. Now, I'd like to turn to the court's question seven and address evidence that supports a finding of permanent as opposed to merely transitory benefits to government of allowing. And, and add to that uh, evidence in the record that establishes that the city and county of San Francisco would suffer some unique injury, particularized injury as opposed to the general injury that might, you might claim for the entire state. Yes, Your Honor. Um, and, and I do think the evidence um, showed harms both to the state as a whole and to local governments in particular. Well, how um, about San Francisco? And San Francisco even more particularly. But I would like to... Why is that? Well, San Francisco in particular, I think the, the, the one thing that stood out is that San Francisco... Uh, well, two, there are two things really, Your Honor. Um, one is that uh, San Francisco is a place where people of all sexual orientations come for tourist reasons, but often to enter into marriage. And so um, the, the city loses revenue because of the lack of the, the fewer number of couples who can marry. And um, that, that harm, I would say, is not transitory in the sense that it won't continue if, as long as Prop 8 remains, although the witnesses, Dr. Badgett and uh, Dr. Egan testified that it would not remain at the sort of spiked level after a year or two. But people will continue to come to San Francisco um, to marry uh, for... Um, from, it's, because it's a marriage destination? Because it's long been, you know, the city of love, the city where people leave their hearts. Um, it, it's a fact of, um, of, of our culture in San cool, Francisco. Cool, city of love. Um, but I, I would actually really, Your Honor, like to turn to some of the more serious harms to government, because I think that's the least of them, to be honest with you. Um, and, and I want to point to a few, and I won't have time to talk about all of them. But the first one that I wanted to mention to the court is that the costs to the public health care system from having to diagnose and treat higher levels of mental health disorders that are induced by stigma from laws that treat lesbians and gay men differently. Um, 
my colleague, Mr. Olson, referred to Dr. Meyer and actually played a clip of his testimony, and he talked about the stigma that laws like Proposition 8 imposed. He also testified about um, the higher incident of, of mental health disorders like anxiety and depression, and he particularly focused on the fact that lesbians and gay men, unlike other minorities, often suffer harm and prejudice at the hands of their own family members, and he talked about how youth, in particular, also are, are affected in a terrible way. Um, they, they can't aspire to become married and have families when they're young and they realize that they're gay. And as a consequence of the, the impact on them, the, the rates of suicide or suicide attempt are higher among lesbian and gay youth. And Dr. Egan testified about the costs that those um, higher incidents of mental health disorders um, uh, cause to the public health system, and he testified about some of the programs that San Francisco has developed um, to try to address specifically those kinds of stigmatic harms. But I think the most compelling testimony on that subject was the testimony of Ryan Kendall, who, who showed two things. He talked about and showed the impact of that kind of discrimination on him as an individual. And he also testified about some of the effects on society at large, some of the ways in which that harm to him uh, uh, caused the public to incur costs. And just to, to lay that out quickly, he testified um, that when his parents found out that he was gay, um, they were horrified, that they believed um, that being gay is a terrible thing, and that they told him so, and they told him in, in pretty awful terms, that, that they wished he had never been born, that, that they wished they had aborted him, that they would have rather had uh, a, a child with a disability than a gay child, and that he would burn in hell, and, and et cetera. And they forced him to try to convert into himself as a 16-year-old child. He testified that he didn't really try to convert. He did. He testified that he didn't believe that he could, that he felt right. his being gay was as clear as his being uh, a person of uh, Latino descent. But he, he was affected dramatically, and he testified about the sense of loss of family and that he Let me suffered. Ask if, if the decision goes against the plaintiffs here, does the city and county of San Francisco have standing to pursue an appeal? Your Honor, we believe that we do, but I do, I, I've never worried, quite frankly, that we would need that standing because I think the plaintiffs um, will most certainly appeal if we... Well, let's assume the plaintiffs decided not to appeal. Your Honor, I, I, I believe we do have standing, and I think it, well, we have standing in the same way that the cities of Boulder and Denver and... Um, I believe Aspen had in the Romer case. They were the plaintiffs then, in that case. Then presumably Imperial County would have standing, would it not? I think it's a little different to, I mean, I'm not sure that Imperial County can come in here and show the court any harm that it suffers to its public health system by um, denying, by, by a, if it were to have to allow same-sex couples to marry. So I guess the court would have to address that issue more specifically. I think we have showed concrete harm. Um, I think that, you know... Then the, let's go back to the particularized injury or harm that the city and county of San Francisco claims. Dr. Egan testified that our public health care system is a cost to the city of about $350 million a year, and that, in his opinion, if the... If, if cost of? The public health care system. That we, in other words... In total. In total. And the public health care system, as he testified, is the provider of last resort for... Uh, many of San Francisco's residents, and that includes many gay and lesbian residents, and that if the stigma that is um, propounded by Proposition 8 were to be eliminated, if it were no longer embedded in our Constitution, that that would reduce the higher incidence of mental health disorder. Um, that was backed up by the testimony of Dr. Meyer, who very carefully laid that out. Now, again, going back to Ryan Kendall, his example, while it wasn't in San Francisco, is, is somewhat what we face, and that is when he was being abused and was so horribly at a loss, he went to the Denver um, Department of Human Resources or Department of Human Health and Human Services, I'm sorry, um, to their juvenile dependency system and sought um, their refuge there and basically became a ward of the state. So they removed him from the parents who were abusing him. He 
also relied on the public health care system for emergency medical care. Why? Because he was 16, 17, 18 years old, couldn't hold a job, wasn't in school, didn't have the resources to cover his own medical care. And he also testified that the stigmatic harm, he didn't call it that, but that the way he felt, he thought he would kill himself if he didn't get help. So he went to get counseling from where? A public um, schools, a public institutions counseling services that were supported by government, local government, because he didn't, again, have the money to support himself. Those are examples of the kinds of costs that the public uh, incurs because of discrimination. I want to touch on a couple of other ones, Your Honor, and they include, um, and there was evidence of the increased law enforcement costs that are required to investigate and prosecute hate crimes and other kinds of um, discrimination that, again, flow from the stigma and, and that society sends the message. And I want to start with Mayor Sanders, who testified that when city leadership talks in disparaging terms, and I'm using his words, or denies people rights that everyone else has, fundamental rights, then I think some people in the community feel empowered to take action in hate crimes and other ways. And he... Well, isn't the problem with that argument that judicial decision, even if a judicial decision by the Supreme Court of the United States wiping out uh, Proposition 8 or similar laws wouldn't eliminate uh, the kinds of motives that give rise to the harms that you've just described. Those are going to exist anyway. They depend upon uh, motives that the law really can't change. Well, actually, Your Honor, I, I don't know that it would end them altogether. I think that's a fair statement, Your Honor. But the, the testimony of Dr. Meyer and Dr. Herrick and of Mayor Sanders, um, who has been mayor and before that police chief, was that when you have structural stigma that's endorsed by the leadership of government and by laws, and particularly laws embedded in the Constitution, um, it does um, send the message, and the message translates into things like hate crimes. And we saw that in California, hate crimes based on sexual orientation in the statistics we offered to the court in the state's reports um, is the second highest category and has been of hate crimes since 1995. Um, there also was evidence about bullying, and bullying in particular in California schools, and the fact that over 200,000 incidents of such bullying based on sexual orientation occur year in, year out. And furthermore, that the state local school districts like ours lose revenue from absenteeism because of bullying in a significant amount, that, that approximately 50,000 absences a year can be attributed to that. And the uh, local school districts are, um, receive money based on attendance, and so they lose that. But they, the state also loses, and the cities lose, the productive uh, work of the students who are not there, who engage in substance abuse and have other harms that are associated with bullying. Your Honor, I, I have little time left, and I would be remiss if I did not um, make one more point and, and make it briefly, and that is this. The city, Your Honor, is acutely aware that when Professor Chauncey testified about the history of governments demonizing and criminalizing and persecuting gay people, he was talking about our city's history as well. And San Francisco once used its police power to harass and shame its own citizens and to force them into the closet and drive gay people and gay life underground. And knowing that we as a city played a role in creating the stigma that continues to afflict our gay citizens and to harm our whole community. San Francisco wants nothing more than to treat its citizens all equally. But Proposition 8 forces us instead to perpetuate the stigma we once helped create by again denying marriage to same-sex couples and gay men and lesbians and sending the message that they are inferior. The evidence that we presented at trial and that plaintiffs presented at trial demonstrates just how hurtful, how deeply hurtful and costly that is, that message is and how irrational and how invidious is the law that forces San Francisco to send that message. So for that reason, we join in the plaintiff's request that the court hold Proposition 8 unconstitutional. Thank Very you, well. Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Stewart. Let me turn to counsel for the governor and the attorney general. Oh, the governor's counsel. 
Proud on behalf of the Governor, Your Honor, the Governor waives uh, his right to make closing argument and thanks, Your Honor, for his time. <laughs> All right. <coughs> I'm delighted that you're here. <coughs> uh, yes. Michelle Enon, on behalf of the Attorney General, the Attorney General waives his time as well. Well, uh, I have questions. Uh, for, I'm not sure whether it's better directed to the Governor, the Attorney General, or maybe the uh, council representing the, uh, uh, the registrars. Um, and that is, ah, uh, yes. Um, Bob Colm representing the Alameda County Clerk Recorder. All right, let me ask you, when in Alameda County, one goes in to apply for a domestic partnership, do you ask the parties to identify their gender? I don't know for a fact, but I don't believe so, Your Honor. How about for marriage licenses? Uh, I believe there may be um, a box that has been reinstated on the marriage license now. Well, we didn't check uh, Alameda County, but just uh, this morning checked uh, San Francisco, Orange County, and Imperial County. And it appears on applications for marriage licenses that in San Francisco there is a box for groom, there's a box for bride, and that's labeled optional. And in Orange County there is a bullet point for groom, a bullet point for bride, and one labeled none. Now, <laughs> and I think the same is true in, in Orange County. And my understanding, although I didn't personally go through the exercise, in the Orange County uh, application, which you can apply for a marriage license online, if you fill out, say, groom, and then fill out the data, and then print, uh, punch next, which would call up the other party, you can put in groom again. It doesn't give you an error message. So what do I make of this? I suppose I can take judicial notice of all these things, can I not? Uh, I, I would suppose so, Your Honor. Um, I don't know what to make of it. I, I would presume that uh, although you can apply for marriage uh, with both applicants being of the same sex, that doesn't mean that the, that the uh, registrar will actually perform the marriage or will, will recognize the marriage. Um, and it may be a way of, of, of um, uh, sorting out applications for marriage that are not currently legal in California from those that would be legal. And by that you mean what, sir? Marriages between we, the, the Alameda County Clerk Recorder was forced to deny applications for marriage from same sex. Um, including the plaintiffs here. Including the plaintiffs from same, same sex applicants after Proposition 8 passed. And how was the determination made that uh, these individuals should not receive a license to marry? In the, in the case, I, I, I suppose it may be on, on the application, if we have an application similar to those, I believe that they are actually state prescribed uh, applications. Um, do they look similar? No, they don't look they similar don't. at all. Well, then, then, they then may, I'm mistaken. They, they may call for exactly the same information. Yes. But um, the forms are quite different in their appearance. Um, in one case that I'm familiar with, which is not the plaintiffs uh, in, in this case, but uh, some people came in and, and did um, uh, tape record uh, or videotape the, uh, uh, their request for an application for marriage, and my, my client called me and asked me what to do. Uh, I don't think there was any question 
that they were of the same sex and, and that in fact they made made clear that they were, were of the of the same sex and, and were applying after the effective date of Proposition 8. And your advice was not to issue the license, I gather. That is correct, Your Honor. Uh, we've, we've said here that, that um, we would follow whatever the holdings of the court are. Uh, we have taken oaths to uphold the uh, laws and constitution of the United States and the state of California. So the determination whether or not this uh, particular couple that is coming before a registrar uh, is, of the, is a couple of the same sex or is a couple of opposite sex is simply made on the spot by whoever is uh, at the desk at the time. I, I don't see much alternative, Your Honor. Uh, would we ask for medical certification or uh, we, we have to take people people at, at, at their word if it turns out that there has been some um, uh, deception. There, there are provisions in the law for recognizing mistake of fact. What, what's the situation if uh, they were to lie? Say you were to have two people who appeared to be men and one said I'm the groom and the other said I'm the bride. Well, I, I think in that case, uh, if, if you, there, there, I see two possible situations, one where where the um, uh, the registrar would or the clerk would 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 it would not look uh, to him as though um, they were of, of uh, different sexes, and he might uh, then have a discussion with them and 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 ask them. I don't don't really know whether we would take them at their at their word because the 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 marriage I think would 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 not would be null because it was it was based on a misrepresentation a fact now what's the situation in the domestic partnership context in which a opposite sex couple cannot become a domestic partners unless one of them is older than age 62 that's that's for California I believe in San Francisco um, they can't at, at less than age 62. Less than, I thought that was a product of state law. Well, the state, there is a state law and there is a San Francisco law. I, I, I know I've, I've, <laughs> Well, I, I've heard I, of that. I, I, <laughs> I, I know that, Your Honor, because I drafted the San Francisco ordinance. I beg your pardon? I said, I know that, Your Honor, because about 20 years ago I drafted the San Francisco ordinance or co-drafted it. All right. Well, um, but... Do I understand that under state law, am I correct in understanding under state law, that only opposite sex couples can become de domestic partners if one of them, one of the individuals is older than age 62 or 62 or older? That's my understanding, Your Honor. Well, what do you do to enforce that limitation in Alameda County? Uh, I, I don't know that we get many cases like that and uh, I suppose it's um, it's rather like uh, uh, somebody going into a bar and it, if you have any suspicion you may ask for for identification um, I, I, I imagine the the uh, wedding ceremony that you performed that you referred to in the in the uh, beginning of the trial uh, where I believe one one member was 90 and the other was 85 or something such as that. Uh, had, had there been an age limitation of 62, I imagine you would not have been asking for, for evidence in that case. I don't think that was necessary. In any event, thank you very much, Mr. Cooper. <laughs> thank you, Your Honor. All right. Well, we've come to uh, lunchtime, and Mr. Cooper, you're up uh, at 1 o'clock, and I'll look forward to hearing uh, from you at that time. Uh, let's adjourn until 1 o'clock. This, does the clerk have an announcement? Yeah, we would like to make an announcement. All right. The clerk wishes to make an announcement. Before you leave the courtroom, can you please stay and listen to the... If you intend to return to this courtroom, first of all, there's a second overflow that has been opened. 
So there is, if you intend to, ret to return this afternoon, we suggest you leave a personal item to, reser to reserve the same seat. If you already have received a court-issued pass for the proceedings, you must use, you must use that pass to, ret to return to your designated courtroom. None pass holders seated in the main courtroom had been provided with an orange double ticket, which must be shown to resume a seat after lunch. All other non pass holders seated in the overflow courtrooms must obtain a colored sticker before leaving for, court, for lunch. Court personnel will be at the overflow courtroom doors to provide the stickers before you exit the courtrooms. You must be seated before the afternoon session begins or your seat may be reassigned. Thank you. See you at 1 o'clock. Thank you, Your Honor. I didn't say that, but that was his eyes, right?